thank you for that introduction, uh, Richard. Um, again, uh, my name is Frederick Heinzel, and I did, I've did i worked for some five years on the Polytrauma Center at uh, James A. Haley uh, VA. And um, I give this talk uh, in part to um, uh, give an overview of uh, what happens on the polytrauma uh, uh, department, what, what it is, uh, how many federal agencies are involved in it, and, uh, and a, a, a more of a general overview of what sort of diseases you're going to see there. And I don't focus strictly on infectious diseases here. There's plenty of that, but there are a surprising number of diseases associated with uh, traumatic injury that uh, can masquerade as infectious diseases. And so, and uh, that does something to be very careful of. And so, uh, as I go through this, I'll give you examples of uh, some of these uh, uh, strange cases. Um, it's it's a very unusual environment. Uh, basically, this is um, these are basically uh, uh, wounded soldiers from the OEF and OIF conflicts. Um, the Polytrauma Center itself is funded not only by the Department of Defense but also by um, uh, the VA, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and uh, with additional funding from a variety of uh, NCOs. <coughs> So what is polytrauma? That's, that's typically a combination, and this, this seems very self-evident as you read through this, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, orthopedic injuries, amputations, traumatic eye injury, and burns. Um, there, there's also an ISS score you can uh, generate, injury severity score. If it's greater than 17, that's considered polytrauma as well. So there are actually some reasonable definitions here. What is the Polytrauma Center? As I mentioned, a unique collaboration between the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, to primarily aimed at rehabilitative care of wounded active duty soldiers. Uh, there are four uh, VA centers um, if that are polytrauma centers. Uh, Tampa is the largest and the most active, so we're really kind of the mothership for this system. Um, there are some, there are some un, what we're used to seeing, uh, not only is it the largest, most active, we also tend to get patient numbers increasing whenever there's a combat surge in either Afghanistan or some other uh, um, uh, conflict. So it's probably going to have a fairly long life since I, I just judging, I mean, we're, you know, if we have any more wars, this is just going to be a, a something we're going to have to live with. So, but anyway, <coughs> um, what's, What's notable about in, in the current conflicts are the, the prevalence of blast injuries uh, that have really eclipsed many of the other injuries. And uh, more than half of all injuries, in fact, are, are generated from exposure to IED blasts, which are uh, increasingly uh, prevalent these days and probably increasing in number. Um, head trauma predominates as the most disabling injury, in, in part because of you know, the sensitivity of the brain to uh, any sort of uh, physical trauma. Um, there, there are interesting characteristics about IED blasts, and it, it, it's, it's actually fairly complex. Uh, during an IED blast, um, there's a very rapid and tightly compressed front of air that gets blown out, and it actually it proceeds at an incredible rate of speed, and there, there's a resulting intense sh uh, overpressurization that hits the person. Now, what happens, um, there, there are a couple different parts to this. Uh, sort of the, the primary uh, effect are sheer uh, uh, force injuries. Those consist of mostly just the damage caused by the overpressurization. Pressurization that's followed immediately by a, uh, a sort of a, uh, um, a corresponding and reverse uh, uh, depressurization as it kind of rushes on back again. And what that results in shear forces in tissues, particularly if you have hollow viscous, that, that compression, and then that suddenly that sudden expansion out, forceful expansion out, results in enormous amount of, of shear stress. And this uh, is part of what causes uh, 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 acoustic uh, trauma to the, to the eardrums. Um, if, in fact, that, that's usually a very good marker for someone who's had a significant exposure to an IED blast. Usually those patients will have other injuries as well. Uh, the, is, um, the, uh, 
the, the, the Israeli, uh, the, the Jerusalem, you know, bomb explosions back many years ago, uh, really sort of laid the ground for this because uh, you, you could actually really triage patients on a, on these sort of a, a acoustic uh, and pressure induced injuries, including uh, pulmonary edema, uh, rupture of hollow viscous. So that, that's something we look for as well. But, you know, uh, one of the, the things you look for first would be, you know, a, a ruptured eardrum. Um, so um, other things that happen, not only that, that pressurization and, and the shear forces, is that actually uh, you can propel people through the air. And they, they then impact on a wall, they impact on a car or something. So that's another form of injury. And then um, uh, additional uh, uh, injuries uh, will also in, in include sometimes actually poisoning from the blast itself. There are uh, some of the IED blasts now that are using uh, complex uh, um, uh, nitrite driven uh, um, explosives and you can actually uh, get uh, hypotension. Basically it's, it's like a, a, a super inducible form of uh, nitroglycerin and um, these these patient these subjects will actually have uh, marked uh, hypotension and uh, bradycardia so all sorts of bad things happen signature traumas associated with ID blasts are closed and open traumatic brain injury um, multiple fractures uh, again from the shear forces uh, th that's strong and it's actually this kind of rend limbs right off the body and that in fact is an extremely common phenomenon now it's it's typical to see uh, double amputees triple amputees uh, in the polytrauma center uh, often the, the, the scrotum gets blown off entirely so th these are all just devastating injuries remarkably many of these patients do very well over a period of time and that's where the poly you know the, the rehabilitation facility at, at the VA becomes very important we, we do some fairly amazing things there Okay, so um, along with this, though, on, on the field itself, you're going to have to worry uh, from you know, traumatic amputation and all these. You have to worry about significant blood loss and hollow viscous injuries, of course, uh, uh, present either early or late. Um, the late presentations are usually um, are um, uh, um, basically f forms of uh, a cholecystitis, uh, as, um, and mostly because of the damage to the wall of the gallbladder and those uh, generally pop up about you know four five months after presentation <clears throat> surgical wound infections are because there's so many uh, uh, you know the, the, the rocks and shrapnel uh, their uh, soft tissue uh, wounds are, are, are very common Soft tissue infection isn't necessarily a huge problem with IED bomb blasts. Part of it is that um, uh, they get a lot of pepper and you can get a lot of stones in, into the skin uh, or under the skin. Uh, generally, you don't do much of those. You let them kind of work their way out. And that, that's pretty much standard operating procedure. Um, you would only work, um, and, and surprisingly, a lot of the, the, um, the shrapnel that gets penetrated through the skin uh, doesn't necessarily cause an infection um, uh, unless you mess with it. Uh, you know, and uh, there's debris, you know, unless there's um, devitalized tissue. <coughs> um, because of uh, the orthopedic injuries, uh, there's a lot of orthopedic fixation, um, you know, open or uh, penetrating uh, brain injuries often require use of ventricular peritoneal shunts because of all the, uh, the, the blood products that develop in the ventricular system. And... Um, and that, of course, becomes another site of infection. Um, and eventually, also, uh, patients who develop uh, ha have cranioplasties due to head trauma um, are also at risk for infection. So this, this is actually a very broad spectrum of both hardware-associated and just soft tissue uh, infections that you're going to see um, basically downstream from uh, these uh, wounded soldiers. OK, now, this is an interesting curve that um, I don't know how good the, the, the early data is, but they've been able to estimate over time um, the number of combat deaths that occurred in different conflicts, starting with the Revolutionary War. And of course, that's a very high combat death rate because it, there wasn't really much in the way of, uh, you know, uh, acute care for uh, traumatic injuries. Uh, it, it basically, the, um, the soldiers would lie in the field and, you know, it, this hope for the best. Um, World War II, World War II <coughs> of course, bumps down significantly. Korean War is a little bit better. Vietnam to the Persian Gulf kind of plateaued out a little bit. What happened over just the last couple of years is for the IEF and IE, uh, e, oh, IEF and OEF 
conflicts, you, you now have a, a marked decrease in combat death rates. The major reason for that is the increasing emphasis over the last decade on frontline <coughs> deployment of medics trained and equipped for resuscitative care of severely wounded soldiers on the field, um, as well as rapid recovery and air transport of casualties uh, to secondary and tertiary care centers and eventually uh, to the continental United States. Uh, by and large, they these um, uh, forward uh, medics are able to uh, keep the patients into the golden hour until they can get uh, transported eff uh, eff eff efficiently. So that's probably had a, has a lot to do with why they re reduced um, uh, mortality on the field. Um, the medics now, new medics, the, the current crop of medics have um, a, a lot of uh, techniques at their command. Um, one of the thing we've seen a lot is that because of the ID blasts, I mean, they don't discriminate between tissues. Um, there, there's usually a lot of facial injury a after uh, IED blasts. And in that situation, you can't really intubate orally. So um, after a period of time, they realized that they had to go to a, a cricotracheostomy. And so the medics now have these little cricotracheostomy kits that they, they put in a little fanny pack. Um, the other problem that uh, was encountered is, uh, you know, amputate, amputated limbs and uh, you know, fatal bleeding. Uh, there are, uh, there's a whole generation, a couple generations of self-applied tourniquets. The one on the, the top right, I've actually, um, uh, some people have kind of demonstrated that uh, uh, in, in the public trauma department. But um, basically, uh, you can just put this loosely on, on the arm, or you can just carry it a little bit. But you, with one hand, you can basically put it over and then you just crank that little knob there and it actually uh, generates a, uh, a tight tourniquet effect. The left lower corner um, you've got uh, the, what well, that's actually, excuse me, that's the correct with that kit. They also have um, uh, uh, um, needles for uh, pneumothoraces and there's also a couple generations of hemostatic packs. <coughs> These consist either of chitosan, which is a form of um, hydrolyzed shrimp shell. And what it does is it, it actually tends, it becomes an extremely absorbent material. So if you put it in contact with blood, what happens? Um, the serum and water in the blood is going to go be absorbed by the chitosan. And this concentrates the clotting factors in the non-aqueous phase of that. So what happens there is that you reach a critical threshold where the the, um, the, the, uh, the, the amount of clotting factors um, actually uh, basically go to uh, completion and that results in clotting. <coughs> the other compound they're using is zellite, which basically is a form of clay. And when it's in contact with water, it, it heats up, but at the same time, it absorbs the aqueous portion of the blood. And by concentrating the clotting factors again, you, you can speed up the clotting process. Um, they also transfuse uh, uh, clotting factors independently, but those have been associated with uh, significant uh, um, uh, thrombotic and um, uh, um, thrombotic events downstream, usually within about the first two weeks or so. So they've, they've kind of backed off on that. Turns out that these um, hemostatic packs seem to do a better job than that without the uh, downstream complications. Um, these are things you're not really going to see. It's just that when you read the, the records that always come with us, we have these very detailed records. You go pages and pages, and then you sit down in uh, uh, the, uh, the conference room, and we go over it. It's, you need to know these things about these patients. So um, uh, that, that's why we, uh, I'm going over this, just so that you can look back on that and kind of interpret, OK, this happened, and you know, some, cons some idea of what uh, uh, the sort of co downstream uh, consequences may be. OK, and again, this is um, uh, actually a decompressive needle for uh, a pneumothorax. And again, that's carried by medics uh, on the front line. Uh, it's about a three and a half inch decompressor needle with a flash port. So, so there's a lot of stuff that people can do basically under fire. I mean, even crawling from foxhole to foxhole, you know, ducking behind, behind rocks. <coughs> and uh, the, the medics will, are incredibly dedicated people. Um, the, the medics in the current conflict actually have fairly high fatality rates because they're in the absolute thick of it. Um, so uh, they 
it, it's it's the, the remarkable group of people who do this. A lot of them actually have been um, uh, civilian medics. Uh, um, in, in their, their kind of previous life, a lot of these guys, when they go back into civilian life, uh, they actually uh, um, they're they're very competitive for you know EMT um, jobs. <coughs> okay, but the other thing that's very important in in bringing down all these fat fatality rates is the fact that you can time you can provide timely evacuation to the next level of care. <coughs> I talked a little bit about the golden hour after trauma, that's the time where you really have the opportunity to impact on the long-term outcome. One, most because of home, uh, hemostasis. Uh, the other is making sure, uh, you know, uh, effective oxygenation, airway uh, uh, maintenance, uh, fluid resuscitation. <coughs> Once you get past that, though, then um, uh, you, you need much more interventive uh, procedures uh, in order to preserve their life. And one way that the military does this, they actually have these inflatable tents. Uh, it's a deployable rapid assembly shelter tents. The drash, uh, they just have a big generator. They have generators and they have these big uh, blowers and they just blow the whole thing up. And this is sort of at a, a second le level of uh, the, um, uh, the, the medical care what's called forward surgical teams. <coughs> they can actually equip these deployable tents. But it is it's just they're just like a big sort of like a Humvee. They just go roaring out there. They take out all of the equipment that blows everything up. And then they have ventilator equipped beds. They can actually ventilate people there. Um, Prepack surgical and ICU kits. They have handheld lab units for electrolytes, uh, um, blood gases, hemograms. They also, everyone now has these portable ultrasounds, and that, that also helps a great deal. But they don't do radiography, they don't do angiography. Um, at this point is where they continue resuscitative um, uh, care, you know, mostly uh, addressing hemostasis and uh, fluid resuscitation. <coughs> Um, this is the point where you have to worry about damage control surgery, and there's this thing called the deadly triad. <coughs> you got you got the golden hour, and then you got the deadly triad. Um, these all kind of downer terms, you know. But <coughs> okay, so you avoid the deadly triad. Patients who are coming back from the front line almost typically will have hypothermia. I mean, just just from uh, systemic shock, um, hypothermia. Uh, they're, they, they lose their ability to, uh, um, they, they, there's probably some disconnect in uh, metabolic uh, metabolism. Um, and there's also, it's very typical to have coagulopathy. And part of that too is because of massive bleeds. Uh, you have ruptured veins, you have pieces of endothelium and everything. So, and of course, uh, you're, you're going to um, probably develop a form of DIC with all this. Metabolic acidosis, well, that's because they bled out massively in many cases. And it's not uncommon for you looking through the notes uh, that come back that some of these patients uh, bleed down to, you know, you know, it's maybe, you know, two-thirds, one-third of their volume sometimes. It's just really amazing that these people even survive. But anyway, so this is where you, you um, basically you uh, um, resuscitate them with fluids. Um, and what you need to do in this situation is because each condition worsens the both of the, both of the others, um, you, you try to, with one of the, 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 the uh, variables up there. Uh, typically, hypothermia is a good one to start with because you can actually get these uh, kind of uh, silver-coated um, space blankets. Uh, they can be heated with heating units, and that, that can provide some, uh, some benefit. Uh, if you can control coagulopathy, maybe you can make the metabolic acidosis better because then they're not bleeding as much. So it's these things you, these are the variables that you have to work with. Um, but this isn't, but uh, at this point you still need some damage control. Um, <coughs> and this is not really def definitive repair at this time. So the length of stay is generally not meant to be, last longer than three hours. Again, because they're still not out of the woods at all. Um, what it is is each, these are just little increments of improving their the metabolic state until they can get to something that's uh, more definitive. Okay, and a more definitive place is going to be a tertiary care hospital, in this case Lundstall um, in, in, in Germany, is the place that uh, people would go, there you've got angiography, there you've got invasive, um, um, you got uh, radiologic invasive procedures, you can put coils in to, uh, you know, clot uh, bleeds, you can snake catheters in here, and uh, so there, there's a lot you can do. 
Um, so uh, in this particular situation, getting to Lunchtool involves a flight on a C-17 usually. And there are some problems on C-17s on the way there. They're really not a totally full service ICU. Some people talk about them as flying ICUs, but they're not really totally full service. So the problems they have here is they're just basically trying to keep things stable until they get to the continental United States, or CONUS as they call it. And if you look at all the, 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 the uh, uh, um, uh, chart material that you're going to be reading, you're going to see CONUS mentioned on it. This just means you know, they're trying to get them back to the continental United States. That's your typical military speak. <coughs> what happens on these flights, uh, you, yes, you, you've got nurses, you, you can hang bags, uh, you can probably hang antibiotics, although sometimes they have to call for the antibiotic. And uh, sometimes they'll, they'll fly off without the antibiotic on occasion. That, but um, so, so you've got nurses, you've got medics, um, and eventually they go to, um, that's the Walter Reed, which I guess they're shutting down now and the National Naval Medical Center, which the, Na the uh, uh, Walter Reed people are going to be moving over to. I don't know if they even had the, the building is already up. I think the last thing I heard was at Walter Reed, now at National Naval Medical Center. Yeah, yeah. but, but it's, it's, I think it's all at National Naval Medical Center yeah. at this point. It's not like there's two separate buildings. Right, exactly. They're just incorporating them. Now, that's kind of interesting because I've, I've actually visited there in, you know, a couple years ago. And, um, you know, you, you've got... You, you've got the Navy, you've got the Army, and you've got the Air Force, and they all have their own ideas about how they want to do that. And there's always kind of a little bit of tension, you know. That's those are my beds. <laughs> so, so you see this, um, and this is where we really get to definitive care. Okay, finally, w once this is all over, blood pressure's restored. <laughs> blood pressure's restored. Uh, the uh, you know uh, hemostasis is, is managed. Uh, if there's any traumatic brain injury, they're taking care of that. And all these things that are moving along, um, they get to a point where they're stable enough that there are discussions between James A. Haley, James A. Haley, VMC, and either Walt, Walter Reed or what other major tertiary hospital is referring to. Sometimes they even fly straight from Lunchtall here. That, that's fairly rare, though. Um, and at that point, um, patients are identified as to whether they're appropriate for rehabilitation. <coughs> and that's what's important here, because what we have is a huge rehabilitation ward here. Uh, we also, the, 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 um, the VA also has resources for in, uh, interventive uh, uh, treatments as well, uh, major surgery if needed. Uh, but uh, really, the screening should take place in, in the big, um, uh, military hospitals so that you have a fair idea of what they're like coming down here. There's a fair assurance that they're not going to crash their blood pressure as soon as they get here. Still happens every now and then. And so some of these discussions we have with uh, the, the military hospitals are uh, we have to be very careful with that. And so again, uh, when when you're on the wards doing this and you're in these uh, discussions, uh, it's, it's very informative. All right. <coughs> Okay, so the other thing about the Polytrauma Center is that there's an enormous amount of staffing because there, there are just so many different types of problems that can occur uh, in these patients as they attempt to rehab. Um, it's also fairly expensive, too. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of salaries going to this. Um, so uh, you, you have rehabilitation physicians, you have RNs, you have clinical case managers, speech therapy, physical therapy, orthotics, occupational therapy, and then you get all the consultants. So it, this is really kind of a really big program. And uh, fortunately, we have that. Um, so in general, we can find the um, uh, consultants and uh, the uh, uh, practitioners that we need. OK. So again, the signature trauma of, uh, of um, polytrauma is typically a, a TBI. And that's and we actually have a lot of interest in TBIs here. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can do this, and it, these seem pretty obvious. Penetrating injury, uh, we we have a fair number of patients that have actually had uh, bullet, penetrating bullet wounds uh, into the brain. Uh, some of them do better. Some of them actually do very well. One of the things I find about this is that the amount of injury the brain can take, and it, it, sometimes it rewires itself very well. We have a lot of patients that have completely astounded us in their, their recovery. So that, that's one thing I think is actually very positive when you come away from this. Uh, blunt force, uh, usually this is fracture related. You know, they, 
you know, they get hit in the head with something, uh, they have a you know, blunt object. Um, blunt force also causes something called diffuse axonal injury. And what it is, it's a form of, of uh, programmed cell death of the, uh, the neurons in the brain. And no one knows exactly why it gets triggered, but what it is, essentially, it's, it's a program that results in death of that axon. And it actually leaves a form of you can really trace that when you're looking at MRI scans, because actually, they, these as these axons and nerves degenerate, you actually see hemosiderone form within the brain. And so when you look at that, uh, you, you if you see the hemosiderone, you can say, aha, this is probably uh, oxonal de degeneration, and um, which is just. A, you know, it, it's something to be aware of, and there are specific ways you can try and address the rehabilitation of that. Uh, okay. Uh, then, of course, uh, da, 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 you can also get significant brain damage from the tax skull if you have intracranial bleeds from def and uh, from um, uh, broken vessels. The other thing we see, um, and I talked about facial injuries and how hard it is to intubate those patients. Uh, in many cases on, on the, the combat field, um, you, you see these notes coming through and you know people get blown up and they, they fall face down into a puddle and the firefight is so, so intense that people can't get to them and so there's delayed resuscitation. We have a lot of patients of anoxic encephalopathy and uh, we also have an additional group of patients who um, have tried to commit suicide. And suicide, unfortunately, is a very significant problem in the current FONFLEX. It's just, it's, it's just so overwhelming. Uh, people are, going, are continually going on new tours. And I, I think it, at some point, it's just too much for them to bear. And unfortunately, uh, suicide attempts and successful attempts in many cases occur. We have a fair number of patients who have anoxic encephalopathy. Um, Again, they can do surprisingly well. It's you can never really predict. It's just uh, there's just a lot of um, uh, it's just kind of amazing how some of these guys come through it. But there are other things of like anoxic encephalopathy that you get some unusual um, uh, diseases. Um, well, okay, I'll start here. So, okay, back to the brain trauma. I just want to point out that, of course, you all know that. Uh, in the setting of a, a, a cerebral hematoma, uh, it's important to evacuate that um, and. I'm kind of moving into craniectomy here. I just realized I dropped one slide, but okay. So one of the things, one of the signature, okay. So the signature trauma of a uh, brain injury, uh, we also have a signature surgery for that, which is craniectomy. And the goals of that is to evacuate hematomas in part, if, uh, and then to uh, debris, divide, devitalize tissue from the brain, and to avoid internal herniation and cerebral hypoxia. I showed some pictures of herniation before, but going through all of them just takes a little too long. <coughs> So look at this. So what's wrong with this CT scan of the head? Hmm? It's swollen. That's, it's, swollen. it's packed is what it is. It's just crammed in there. Okay, so what happened in the meantime? Well, okay, so there's not, whoopsie, nothing there. I, I forget that I can do this. Okay, so there's nothing. You can't really see anything here. You come out to here, and now you're you're, you're seeing uh, the um, the ventricles. And the reason for that, but look at this over over here. So what's happened here? Craniectomy. Right. That's right. Okay. And what you do is you do cover it up with uh, uh, membranes uh, and uh, dura, and as well as uh, the aponeurosis uh, of Galen. So this is really usually a watertight thing here. So this allows you to decompress out by just expanding out through the hole in the brain, uh, the, the skull rather, and it, these patients will have like big pouches on the side of, of their head. And it looks, it looks weird. Um, again, these patients can do very well with that. So uh, just keeping things positive here. Okay, now up at uh, Walter Reed and other places, they get a little fancier about this, and they're very concerned about the degree of anoxia that's incurring some of the most severely wounded soldiers. And so often you'll see that some of these patients have had a thing called a Lycox ca uh, catheter. This is actually just an oxygen sensor that they just pop down through a bolt hole. And you can kind of monitor oxygen tension, and you can actually actually look for a metabolic waste products that would be suggestive of, ex of uh, you know, uh, loss of respiratory um, uh, metabolism. And 
yeah, intracranial pressure catheters are very typical. Um, and of course those are in the ventricles and they can give you additional information. Uh, what happens in some of these patients though, it's just not as simple as uh, you know, a, a, a bleed. Uh, often uh, you will also have um, infarcts as well. This is kind of fading out. Okay, so the infarct here for instance. So this person unfortunately also has a uh, right-sided uh, infarct. So uh, these, these are very complex cases, but uh, using these technologies, you at least get some handle on, on what to do. <clears throat> okay, so, so there's two reasons you might want to put something into that craniectomy. Now that that person has decompressed and they're doing better, and we have a whole lot of patients who are sort of at the setting here, there's a lot of discussion about do we put a cranioplasty in? A cranioplasty, of course, being a either a titanium, a bone, or a plastic prosthesis that fits into the open area here. And then you can approximate all these. These can all be done by computer-generated imagery, and you can actually then cut them out of titanium using uh, computers. Um, so on one hand, um, this protects the brain from injury. Uh, number two, d some patients find this sort of deformity when they've had a, a craniectomy as being, uh, you know, uh, very uncomfortable. You know, that's some of these guys when they look at that after they've had their craniectomy, they're very upset. Um, but uh, a cranioplasty um, will improve that. So here we go. You have a cranioplasty that's been engineered specifically to fit into that particular defect. And uh, yeah, you've got some uh, sutures and you've got some incisions there, but that, that's obviously a, a better cosmetic um, uh, approach. <coughs> now the cranioplasty is nothing new. Uh, in fact, World War I, their uh, cranioplasties were used very extensively uh, in, on the, uh, the field of combat. <coughs> Alexander Primrose. <coughs> Excuse me, I... Okay, LED lights about shot. Okay, so um, so this is nothing new. Cranioplasty has been around for a long time. And unfortunately, with uh, the cranioplasty being around a long time, um, it's what's, what's a cranioplasty? Okay, well, if it's bone, bone may be a little bit resistant to infection, but when you start using artificial materials, and we do a lot of that, particularly you know our um, <coughs> our, uh, our 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 um, metal cranioplasties uh, have a propensity for infection. And so how does this present? It's really pretty typical. It's pretty much like if he had a uh, hip arthroplasty and begins it's infected. What happens? You get pain, you get inflammation, you start seeing drainage, and the drainage gets worse. And this is essentially what happens there because what it's it's solid material. No way this, this foreign material is ever going to be able to heal up to anything. So um, uh, that has to come out. And the treatment of infected cranial plasty is basically is remove the infected device and evacuate all the perlite material, close the wound, debridement of if there's any sort of uh, devitalized tissue or not, uh, treat to four to six weeks with appropriate antibiotics, and many times that gets extended depending uh, if you're doing uh, looking at um, uh, 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 inflammation uh, markers that sometimes that make it go a little longer. Uh, but DOD guidelines uh, recommend delaying reimplantation of cranioplasty for at least six to 12 months. So in most cases, you would actually treat someone for a couple months, you'd leave them alone for a while until they get out to about 12 months out. Uh, it's a little bit like the, uh, again, uh, exchange of arthroplasties because by the treatment, uh, once you treat them, uh, once you have uh, tissue that's normal, usually it takes care of the bacteria. <coughs> And the reason, of course, for that is uh, the uh, biofilm problem. Uh, biofilm, of course, uh, being uh, bacteria that go from planktonic to, a ses to sort of a, a sessile form, uh, they form glycocalyx on, on tissues and also on, on um, prosthetic materials. And the only way to, you can't treat that with antibiotics, no way, no how. So you have to remove the um, prosthetic. And we've had a couple patients where they've had two or three or four cranioplasties in and taken out again, and eventually things work out. So again, um, it, it's remarkable how tolerant these patients are. And part of that's probably because you know, they're all, these are all guys and they're sort of, they're, <coughs> they're ranging anywhere from like 19 to maybe 35 years old. 35 is considered a fossil in, in military parlance. But okay, so um, part of that is just that they're incredibly healthy to begin with. Uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt placement um, 
because of the penetrating brain injuries, because of uh, frequent uh, craniectomies, uh, craniotomies for uh, skull damage, for skull fractures, for um, trying to evacuate hematomas, uh, sometimes actually uh, trying to uh, go in and actually tie off bleeding arteries in the brain. Um, we do see infections inside the brain. And often uh, these aren't necessarily just a cerebral abscess each time. It, we, uh, more typically, that will also present as um, infected CSF. <coughs> and again, here's the little tip of the uh, um, ventricular peritoneal catheter. Um, the usual VP shunt co complications uh, um, uh, include obstruction uh, and infection, either acute or subacute. Typically, infection will also trigger obstruction um, as well. So um, what will happen to these patients, uh, they develop sometimes inflammation along the uh, VP shunt tract. <laughs> you can see a big red rim all the way up where you have the VP shunt burrowing down over to right uh, subcutaneous tissues. Uh, occasionally you can see an abscess pockets in the peritoneum since it goes all the way down to the peritoneum and there's fluid collection there typically and that can cause, uh, that can be a, a place to attract infection. Um, and and the, the real tip off those altered mental status, sometimes virility, and increased hydrocephalus if you have to take them down to the CT scan. In that situation, you take the BP shunt out. You assume it's invested with biofilm and it's the same drill. Um, you uh, treat uh, the CSF. You can actually treat CSF by injecting directly into the ventricles. Uh, genomycin, tobramycin, uh, th those actually work very effectively for this. In fact, um, uh, e even some of the, um, I'm kind of blanking on it, but whatever. Um, so you, you can actually get gram, good gram positive and gram negative positive coverage by simply injecting many milligrams into the CSF. It works well, okay? As long as you don't use preservative in the saline. That's one thing to look out for. The diagnosis is pretty typical. You basically, you, you get neurology to come to aspirate out of the, the VP shunt if, if, if it's implanted or um, sometimes you can go uh, lumbar puncture, but typically you want to go to the VP, inf the infected VP shunt itself, because that's really where the bugs and the white cells are going to be. Um, it can be very benign with staph epidermis, which is the commonest cause of infection here, also one of the harder ones to, to get rid of. Uh, you probably don't have more than 10% neutrophils. Um, often you don't even have, uh, the, the glucose may be re reasonably normal. So it, it, it's seemingly benign, but uh, you always have to worry that uh, you know, this can, uh, it, it's something that still needs to be treated and taking the, the, the VP shunt out is, is best. You treat for probably a couple weeks, wait until you have at least three sterile cultures from uh, either uh, um, ventriculostomy or from uh, CSF, and then you can try and implant uh, another VP shunt. Um, again, I've seen several patients who have had two, three, four VP shunts. Or revision sometimes. So um, this is something we do and um, you're going to see a lot of it. And uh, I have a lot of resources in terms of uh, the journal trauma is actually a very good journal. I have a lot of articles cribbed out of that that will go through discussions of uh, treatment of, of VP shot infections, treatment of uh, infected uh, open um, lower extremity, uh, lower extremities. Um, and a lot of discussion, uh, which is actually a fairly controversial discussion, is exactly how long do you wait before you replace a cranioplasty after someone had previously had a cranioplasty infection. The families get very anxious about that. So uh, these are things that you know, I have some literature I can help spread around uh, to help you with that. Uh, it's, it's mostly literature written by uh, Walter Reed in the Department of Defense. So they, they, they know what they're doing, I hope. Okay, so management of VP shunt infection, as I mentioned, basically remove it. You can do interventricular antibiotics, remove the device biofilm. Uh, you do have to coordinate with neurosurgery. Uh, for shunt-dependent patients, if you take the shunt out for a while before you put a new one in, you want to make sure that they don't immediately go straight over into hydrocephalus. So um, try and make friends with your neurosurgeons. What is the time interval for replacement? I know you mentioned three taps, but is that usually a few weeks or a couple months? Um, I, I, well, there, there's no hard, we don't actually have a hard rule for that. For me, it would be like every three days, I would test it, I'd go another three days, I'd go another three days. And if it's clear, um, um, 
than, uh, you know, it, 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 that's often under antibiotic treatment too. So, I mean, it's, you, you have to worry about maybe there are a few bacteria left there still. Um, but um, if, if it's clear, if three uh, uh, um, samples are clear for, infect for um, microbial growth, um, probably be reasonable to go ahead and put a, a clean shunt in. Or you could probably delay a few days. Nine days, you know. So, yeah, I know. All right. So, um, okay, of course, uh, uh, coordinate with neurosurgery. And let's see what else I have here. Okay, and then the other thing, too, it's a little more exciting, a little sexier, I think, than some of this is um, unwanted travelers. And this is something I always kept an eye on. Because I'm not, you know, I, I sort of know the surgical infection business. I, I'm aware of kind of the issues of trauma surgery and everything. But this, this gets to be a lot more exciting here. Um, what happens, uh, these guys, um, ONOBF, OAF, are definitely in uh, risk of infection because they're in theater. And, and, and these places are highly endemic for a lot of critters. For instance, um, uh, uh, malaria endemic countries uh, it include um, Iraq and Afghanistan, which are the ones we really care about right now, although Iraq's apparently not such a problem. And um, for, um, for uh, Afghanistan, um, luckily, uh, it's mostly chloroquine-sensitive malaria. There's also a whole lot of uh, Plasmodium vivax as well. Uh, other places are, uh, uh, in those areas are, a lot of other places where you might get resistant to uh, uh, malaria, but um, uh, fortunately for the troops, that, that's not an issue. Um, again, malaria is endemic in OEF, OAF, um, both Vivax and Falciparum. Uh, on the left side, somebody, tell me, what, what bug is that? And why? Right. And just count the number of erythrocytes that actually have parasite in it. Yeah, so that, that's the other thing you can use. So, yeah, if you start seeing singly infected, a whole lot of singly infected uh, uh, erythrocytes, that's bad too. But that, that makes the diagnosis for falciparum. Over here, um, uh, I, I think this is a nosley. Um, these are trophozoites, and I think these, I thought these are vivax. can't remember what I, that's actually your slide, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, these are, okay, these are trophozoites. <laughs> so this is non-falciparum. We'll just keep it that way. Okay. So um, fortunately, uh, at the VA, uh, there, we have kits for diagnosis of malaria. I mean, obviously, you do thin and thick smears. You look at that. If it looks like there, you can, if you can actually see parasites, uh, that's good. And you can actually, that, that's useful because then you can go to these rapid diagnostic kits, which are basically just, you know, stick ELISA kits. And uh, if you can actually see the parasite, you know there's probably a lot of antigen there. So actually, you've got a real advantage with this kit. You're, you're likely to get a very clean differentiation between is it malaria or not. But more importantly, you can differentiate between falciparum malaria and non-falciparum malaria. And that's, that's a huge advantage. If it's falciparum malaria, if there's any risk that they were in a... Um, uh, 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 chloroquine resistant uh, area of the world, uh, that's something to be very used because now you're going to have to look for alternative drugs to treat. Okay. <clears throat> Prophylaxis of malaria in uh, the, the DOD conflicts basically consists of almost entirely doxycycline, what it comes down to. It's about 100 milligrams um, uh, once a day. Um, and doxycycline is much preferred over methylcline. Now, why would you not? want soldiers flying helicopters and driving tanks uh, on methylquin. No, your drugs. So what happens, the side effect of methylquin is delirium in many cases. Um, and um, during the Haiti conflict, the Haiti uh, recovery and uh, rescue, operations, which actually the, the VA was very much involved with, uh, we saw a number of active duty personnel who were down there assisting in the recovery. And uh, they, they had, you know, chloroquine sensitive 
uh, falciparum malaria. And they did extremely well. I mean, it's surprisingly how fast the chloroquine works in these guys. Uh, they'd get maybe a dose as they're going over to the hospital ship. They'd get another one uh, later. And by the time they came to the VA rehab center, they they were still sick. They had transaminitis and other things. But uh, they, they were vastly better than what they looked like when they first arrived. So it's very exciting because it just gives you a lot of confidence that antibiotics can be very good. So, doxycycline, uh, two days before deployment, you continue for four weeks after return. Okay, is that the end of it? Okay. What, what, is there some sort of terminal prophylaxis? Primaquin. And that's basically because you're, you're getting hypnozoites in, in, in the liver. And if you don't treat those, uh, they'll be fine and they'll be happy. And then guess what? In a couple months or a year or two years sometimes, um, they'll come down with a high shaking fever and they'll have circulating um, uh, marozoites. So, so, um, so that's what the military does for this. Other things we have to worry about, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, tribal chiefs who are very, very progressive and they like to invite American soldiers, sit down, eat with them, they're eating goat, lamb, all of these things. What they don't tell you is what's happening in the back when they're butchering uh, uh, the goat and is, do you think it's FDA and USDA inspected? I don't think so. So um, that, that raises a whole host of characters. And um, I'm just going to go through it fairly, fairly quickly. Most of you know these. But just recognize that you know if you do get people with repeated fevers, unusual fevers, you can't quite figure out what's going on, uh, you, you can try. Um, yeah, you, there are some LISA tests for these, but you know, ideally, you might even want to start looking, see if you can identify an organism here. We we, we could stand better technologies. I mean, you can culture brucella, you can culture Q fever, sort of, but that's a really dangerous thing to do in any lab. No one's going to let you do that. That's like sort of a you got to go to a, a sort of a tier, <coughs> excuse me, a tier three facility. Um, so, um, <coughs> in some cases, you, you you even treat these empirically on occasion. Uh, if, if you think there's a, a clear-cut epidemiologic association. Uh, intracellular infection, uh, targeted hemolithetic organs, that, that's common for brucella in particular. Uh, and uh, other th findings of brucell brucellosis, um, you, you get these in incredible uh, uh, brucella-associated um, um, hydrocele's. And it's very red, it's very tender, and that's that's somewhat uncommon uh, uh, manifestation of disseminated brucella. Brucella, of course, disseminates out of lymph nodes in the body and the bone marrow. And there's a whole variety of strange diseases, including endocarditis, meningitis, and it goes on. Um, you also can get hydrocele's, but um, in this case, that's on a cow. Apparently, for some reason, cows get big hydrocele's on their knees uh, when they're infected with brucella. Okay, um, brucella, and I'll uh, talk about later Q fever. You can also get endocarditis uh, in these patients uh, from eating tainted uh, goat meat and uh, goat uh, sheep meat and that sort of thing. So we haven't. We we probably saw one culture negative uh, endocarditis uh, back about four years ago. Never really could get a diagnosis for that. So it's very frustrating, I think, in part because all the serology serologic kits don't work very well. And uh, yeah, yeah. Remember uh, when we thought we had a brucella case? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, I put too much uh, faith in my my serologies at that point. We still never figured out. Well, we never cultured it out of the blood. We had good blood specimens, so it wasn't that. I know we did. That was a good exercise in itself. <laughs> Okay, um, and then there, there are other diseases uh, that are uh, particularly concerning uh, for um, sheep. And when sheep give birth, uh, there's a particular risk there. Okay, well, acquired, okay, potentially fatal infectious disease acquired by aerosol exposure to placental fluids and tissues. Okay. Q fever, okay. Q fever is endemic in um, uh, the OEF uh, area as well. And um, zoonotic infection spread by aerosol. Okay, just moving along now. Uh, Q fever presentation, flu-like, just about everything else in Mandel. Uh, it starts that way. You can get an atypical pneumonia. Hepatitis, you tend to get thrombocytopenia, which is a little odd. Sometimes that's a good tip-off to let you know what's going on. When I was actually, just before I, I, I um, 
moved to UCSF back many years ago, there was a big outbreak in a sheet model of placental function. There were 19 confirmed cases in one death. And this is inside a uh, premier um, vivarium that um, uh, they, they, they were very proud of. And just they got t totally hosed because uh, that somehow Q fever got into their system. Haiti earthquake, I mentioned that. Plasmonium falciparum, chloroquine sensitive. Um, didn't see any dengue. Leptospirosis, we definitely saw. Um, cholera, I think typhoid occurred later, but that was pretty well after our uh, soldiers had left there. So we didn't bring anything back to uh, Tampa. Uh, we did uh, see one special forces uh, um, soldier who um, had this interesting um, fever. Uh, he came to us already at 106. He said it was very dramatic. He had amazing chills. He had pain all up and down his back and down his legs. He started getting a little bit of a rash. He had, he had photophobia. And so we watched him. And he's having these hectic fevers going along. Um, we weren't entirely sure what's going on. We're, we're culturing. We're, we're getting serologies. Nothing much was turning up. At some point, he started getting a little icterous, and he got this rash. And they said, well, what the heck, you know? And it was kind of a little, kind of a short defervescence. We thought, man, this might be consistent with leptospirosis. And so we went ahead and treated with ceftriaxone, which is perfectly good for leptospirosis. Doxycycline would probably work pretty well, too, if you catch it earlier. In fact, doxycycline is a great, great prophylactic for this disease. So, um, yeah, he had, so it just went on and eventually recovered. So just to point out that, um, uh, you know, it, uh, this was probably a case of leptospirosis. process. It's, it's presumptive. Of course, you can get it here. You can swim in the Hillsborough River and get a good case, real good case. Okay, so leptospirosis, I won't go into much here. It's basically leptospira sped into urine of mammals. Contact with water is a major risk factor. It gets into the water system, or you have rat exposures in Baltimore alleys because the rats are peeing on the floor. And uh, the, if you you actually get a little spritz of these spirochetes, like right down here. And uh, if that gets into your body, um, you, you you can get sick. And uh, it's usually, you have asymptomatic rodent carriers, but they can spread it to a variety of mammalian species. And the, the sort of the, the species name for each of the um, um, leptospiral uh, entities uh, often kind of carries the organism that they thought uh, it was uh, originally obtained from. Okay. Okay. Now to back to doxycycline prophylaxis. It's they, doxycycline is used a lot in the military. They like it because it's really pretty gentle antibiotic. People don't get terribly sick with it. Um, um, it's effective against bacterial diarrhea. They can use that. Um, there's some of the rickettsia infections in uh, the Middle East. Apparently, uh, can actually partly be uh, uh, held off with doxycycline. And leptospirosis, uh, probably 200 milligrams a day, is thought to be uh, uh, an effective prophylaxis. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, excuse me, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, Bacillus anthracis, possibly doxy, which is probably about as good as ciprofloxacin. Don't you agree? Cheaper. This is the military. Yeah, military doesn't know. care about FDA. Trump's FDA. <laughs> they have one guy. There's one guy over at uh, Fort Detrick who, you know, kind of goes sort of antibiotics and everything. And um, that does say, we worked as, you know, this is the antibiotic we like. We, we think this is the one that works, and that's what we're, we're going to do. And we don't, they have one guy there who works for the FDA, but then they just kind of run over him. All right. Okay, and then finally, leishmaniasis. I won't go into much here because I actually have a whole other talk on leishmaniasis. Maybe at some point I can do that. <coughs> uh, leishmaniasis basically it's a caused by a leishmania major, which is transmitted by the phlebotomist uh, sandfly, which takes a blood meal. Uh, it spits out uh, little pieces of uh, parasite. Uh, promastigotes of uh, Leishmania major, typically sometimes Leishmania tropica. Uh, they get into macrophages. They 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 grow into macrophages. They pop out, and then they get into other macrophages. And what happens over a period of time? Uh, they actually cause necrosis here, and this is and uh, you know each of these little kind of granulations here. If you put a little needle into that and look at it and, and stain for right gimsa, uh, you'd probably see the uh, the Leishmania in there. It's it's painless or sometimes painful, sometimes painless. And um, it uh, usually it's, um, 
it, it remits eventually, but it can be progressive for a fair part of the time. It can even kind of come and go on occasion. Um, the way to handle this is basically to prevent exposure to uh, the sand fly, which transmits the disease. And down here you see the macrophage with all the uh, amastigotes, which is the intercellular form. <coughs> and here you see the promastigotes. And this is just a life cycle that carries it around. Prevention of both cutaneous leishmaniasis and malaria is pretty much the same. Improve living conditions in field, heighten awareness of leishmaniasis and malaria, use of personal protective equipment, permethrin uh, treated coating, minimizing the amount of exposed skin, insect repellent, and enhance vector control activities. Okay, only other thing to talk about is that we see a lot of resistant acid needle bacter, most because it, it's, it's all being taught in the tertiary care hospitals on the way down here. So yes, we see this and we, we, we are aware of the problem and are working on it. All right, I'm not gonna say much more about that. We know too much about that. What's interesting about this, okay, so dogs, dogs, dogs get brucella big time, okay? So here they are. These dogs are looking at with utter respect to a cat because you know what a cat, it's genetics, it's totally resistant to brucella. It's true. It's to woo. <laughs> so um, I just think that's really kind of a cute slide there uh, because it's, it's, it's not only you know, the, the exposures that you have that make disease. In many cases, it's your genetics as well. And in this case, you know, this is kind of transspecies genetics. But all right. Any questions, questions, comments?